Good morning. It is Wednesday, the November the 14th, and this is The Drill. Thank you very much. This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States of America, because I'm the only one that makes the presumption for the status quo. And this is a show that is for the uh, butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. It's not for the professionals. If you're a uh, doctor or a lawyer or something of that nature, uh, I invite you to go listen to something else. In any case, the five reasons that it is uh, cool uh, to be and great to be a socialist in the United States of America today. Number one, Rush Limbaugh. That's right, Rush Limbaugh. Uh, Rush Limbaugh is in the habit of contradicting himself. He's in the habit of honoring the left. The left should be celebrating each and every day that we have Rush Limbaugh and we have the Rush Limbaugh show and that it is as a successful as it is, that it reaches 2 million, 20 million, or however many millions of people it reaches each and every day, because he is one of the best spokespeople for socialism. He is one of the best promoters of socialism. He does it without being aware of it, but he does it nonetheless. And the way he does it is, uh, the number one way he does it is by dealing with and, uh, and paying attention to arbitrary claims. He should be ignoring those, dealing only with uh, those kinds of claims made by the left that have any evidence or any proof to them. But uh, he doesn't do that. He thinks that uh, everything that comes out of the left's mouth has to be countered, that that's the uh, best strategy. It isn't. If you ca- counter a an, uh, a claim that is... Um, uh, that hasn't been proven or doesn't have any evidence to it, then you're helping your opponent, in this particular case, the socialists. The number two reason uh, that it's great to be a socialist in America today is Sean Hannity. Sean Hannity is, um, he loves the socialists. He contradicts himself. He uh, has socialist friends. Very often on his show, you'll hear about it. He'll tell you, well, so-and-so is a liberal. And I always refer to liberals, by the way, as socialists. The uh, last liberal I know of was uh, J- Thomas Jefferson. But um, he, he'll say, introduce some so-and-so as a liberal, but he and I are friends. He comes over to my house and has dinner and he meets my kids and all that. Okay, so let me see if I get this straight, Sean. On the one hand, you're telling us that we have to go to the polls and we have to elect uh, conservatives, the most conservative people possible, to shun and avoid all the socialists, all the liberals, because if we elect them, they will destroy this country. Those are the words he's used, destroy this country. So they're not good enough to be elected to office, but they're good enough to take home to meet your wife and children. Again, the socialists should be celebrating. They shouldn't attack uh, Sean Hannity. They should be promoting him. The third reason that it's great to be a socialist in America today is uh, Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck, he, uh, during the last election, he decided that it would be better to elect a socialist, uh, Hillary Clinton, rather than a non-socialist. I'm not even going to bother to try and make the case that President Trump is a conservative. Uh, For lots of reasons, you really can't uh, make that claim. He's more of a populist. Um, However, he is uh, keeping his promises. Uh, um, uh, You know, it's... Anyways, he's uh, keeping his promises, and uh, but he's a non-conservative of the two, or non-socialist, let's put it that way. Uh, Hillary Clinton's a socialist. Uh, Glenn Beck uh, goes on a hunger strike. That's right, a hunger strike to try to dissuade people from voting for the non-socialist. Uh, so again, reason that's reason number three that the socialists in this country have it great and will continue to have it great and should be celebrating. Now, I will give Glenn Beck his due. He admitted he was wrong after uh, Donald Trump uh, became, uh, you know, got into office, started keeping his promises, doing exactly what he said he was going to do, and uh, after all the crap 
I mean, the weird BS that he got from news people, uh, Glenn Beck then uh, changed his mind and became a very reluctant Trump supporter. But again, his attitude was uh, better red than dead uh, or better red than Donald Trump. Anything other than Donald Trump, uh, I suppose he probably would have voted for Nikita Khrushchev uh, if he could have. Number four reason that it's great to be a socialist in the United States of America today, and that is Hugh Hewitt. Hugh Hewitt, uh, another ersatz conservative, really a reactionary, who has a a, a radio show, plays in the morning, and he spends 99.9% of his time bragging. He just brags and brags and brags. He brags about who he knows, what he knows, where he knows it, and he has also uh, said some of the most stupid things I've ever heard in my life. I called his show once to tell him uh, something, and he came up with a response that was unbelievably stupid. So, uh, again, uh, fourth reason that uh, it's great to be a socialist in the United States today. Why do you think they're all the... the uh, the kids are be, uh, moving to become socialists, or not all of them, but a significant portion are uh, wanting high school students and college students are becoming socialists because w- what, w- what stands in the way of socialists? Who's opposing them? So far, nobody. The fifth reason it's great to be a socialist in the United States of America today, Mark Levin, the worst voice on radio. And uh, if you're going to put somebody on the air, at least put somebody on with some vocal talent. Don't put them on the air because of who they know. That's the only reason Mark Levin got a show is because he was buddies with Sean Hannity. He used to be able to call in on a regular basis. And the number two reason he's got a show is because he's a lawyer. And I'm about sick and tired of lawyers on the radio. If you're a lawyer, stay in the courtroom. Get off the radio and go to the courtroom. Those are the five reasons that uh, it is great to be a socialist in the United States of America today. Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Glenn Beck, Hugh Hewitt, and Mark Levin. When we come back, well, we'll see. Well, when we come back... We're back. Thank you very much. And it's going to be the uh, Ayn Rand lexicon, uh, which I like to do every day. Ayn Rand lexicon, she goes over concepts, not words, concepts. Uh, Words are arbitrary, sensible signs with meanings imposed on them by convention, but not concepts. Concepts are about essences. What it is, what is the essence of something that makes that something different than anything else. And that's what we get into here. Today's concept, context. Knowledge is contextual. By context, we mean the sum of cognitive elements conditioning the acquisition, validity, or application of any item of human knowledge. Knowledge is an organization or integration of interconnected elements, each relevant to the others. Knowledge is not a mosaic of independent pieces, each of which stands apart from the rest. In regard to any concept, idea, proposal, theory, or item of knowledge, never forget or ignore the context on which it depends and which conditions its validity and use. Concepts are not and cannot be formed in a vacuum. They are formed in a context. The process of conceptualization consists of observing the differences and similarities of the existence within the field of one's awareness and organizing them into concepts accordingly. From a child's grasp of the simplest concept integrating a group of perceptually given concretes to a scientist's grasp of the most complex abstractions integrating long conceptual chains, all conceptualization is a contextual process. The context is the entire field of a mind's awareness or knowledge at any level of its cognitive development. This does not mean that conceptualization is a subjective process or that the content of concepts depends on an individual's subjective, i.e. arbitrary, choice. 
The only issue open to an individual's choice in this matter is how much knowledge he will seek to acquire and, consequently, what conceptual complexity he will be able to reach. But so long as, and to the extent that, his mind deals with concepts, as distinguished from memorized sounds and floating abstractions, the content of his concepts is determined and dictated by the cognitive content of his mind, i.e. by the grasp of the facts of reality. If his grasp is non-contradictory, then even if the scope of his knowledge is modest and the content of his concept is primitive concepts, it will not contradict the content of the same concepts in the mind of the most advanced scientists. The same is true of definitions. All definitions are contextual. And a primitive definition does not contradict a more advanced one. The latter merely expands the former. And by the way, uh, what is the definition of a definition? Genus and differentia. No concept man forms is valid unless he integrates it without contradiction into the total sum of of his knowledge. One must never make any decisions, form any convictions, or seek any values out of context, i.e. apart from or against the total integrated sum of one's knowledge. So, excellent stuff. Uh, very important things, because the left, one of their tactics, favorite tactics, is what Ayn Rand refers to as context dropping. I refer to as uh, materialism, that uh, the idea that words are uh, just all they are, that there are no concepts, that uh, concepts have no basis in reality, and that everything is basically words, and that words, since their uh, meaning is imposed on them by convention, can be changed by uh, will of the majority. And um, that is a, one way that they change, uh, make, create change in our society. For instance, using uh, anti-concepts. They liked, uh, and the most uh, recent case I can think of is the anti-concept uh, stakeholder that they use to displace another concept, which is uh, conflict of interest. That's how we ended up with public employees or uh, public employee unions. Okay, you, we ended up with those because uh, we, it was prohibited before because of an con obvious conflict of interest. Okay, you, you can't serve two masters. can't serve the union and serve the public at the same time. So, uh, but the uh, unions were clever enough to basically get rid of conflict of interest. And they did it by using the word stakeholders. And uh, they were so slick about it that they even got Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh to go along with it. And I want to vomit every time I hear uh, Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity refer to stakeholders. Because they're morons. They're idiots. They don't know what they're doing. They, they do this. They say uh, stakeholders because it, they think it's hip. It's cool. And they've got something to prove that conservatives have to prove to liberals that they're as hip and as cool and as appealing to younger people as the liberals are. Without realizing, no, conservatives never have anything to prove to the left, ever. It's the opposite way around. The left always wants change. The burden of proof, therefore, is always on the left. Back in a minute. Thank you very much. Welcome back. The Death of Right and Wrong, Tammy Bruce. Tammy Bruce, uh, former lefty, uh, become um, conservative slash reactionary. She's kind of in the middle there. Uh, but she has a much better idea of what it is, uh, who the left is, and how they think and how they operate. Rush Limbaugh claims to know. He brags about how he knows them uh, like every square inch of his glorious naked body, Baloney. He doesn't. And, and just listen to him, listen to or um, read any of Tammy Bruce's work, and you'll immediately see the difference. So uh, in this particular chapter, we're on a section called Feminists and Twinkies. What persuaded Judge Conliffe that a depressed woman 
probably craving some beef jerky, should not be prosecuted for stabbing a little boy beyond recognition. How is it that, only for women, mind you, being depressed gives you a license to kill? And this is about uh, what we're covering uh, the last time in in this book was uh, that a woman uh, killed her child and then claimed that it was uh, postpartum depression or something of that nature that caused her to kill her child, and uh, the judge dealt with her very leniently. Prior to dismissing the case against Monica Berger, Judge Conliffe, like all of us, had been assailed by the media frenzy surrounding Andrea Yates, the Houston woman who drowned her five children in the bathtub. In the months leading up to Judge Conliffe's bizarre decision, representatives of now could be heard on virtually every major news show in the country jabbering about how women suffering from depression need to be let off the hook for whatever they may do, including murdering their children. In all its horrifying reality, the Yates case exposed for us now's commitment to using whatever tools may be available to promote their own morally vacuous agenda. Yates became a tool of a left elite determined to convince us that convicting a woman who kills her children is wrong. The dismissal in the Berger case shows us exactly how serious the consequences can be. In one of Now's press releases about Yates, the organization's president, Kim Gandy, ex- complains, quote, the overheated dialogue and the repeated characterization of Andrea Yates as, quote, a monster, unquote, and evil, un. Uh, quote-unquote, interfere with the kind of clear-headed dialogue we must have, unquote. What what had led to the, quote, overheated dialogue, unquote, and characterization as a, quote, monster, unquote, to which Gandhi took such exception? On June 20th, 2001, Andrea Yates systematically drowned her five children in the bathtub. When her eldest son, Noah, age seven, came into the bathroom and saw his six-month-old sister, Mary, lying deadly still in the water, he asked, What's wrong with Mary? Yates, facing her last surviving child, replied by telling Noah to get into the tub. In a desperate effort to save his own young life, he ran. Tragically, he could not escape his mother and became her fifth victim. In the course of her interrogation by the police, Yates revealed that as she began to drown her son, he asked, Mommy, have I done something wrong? If there was ever anything to get overheated about. If there was ever anything representative of evil, it is the acts of Andrea Yates. Kim Gandy's confusion about right and wrong in this case should indicate, at the very least, how rotten to the core a once truly great organization has become. Despite, or perhaps because of, its depravity, the Yates case became a perfect gimmick for the feminist and left elite to use in marketing their special brand of moral relativism to the public including people like Monica Berger's judge. What a coup it would be if the feminist elite could persuade the American public to accept the murder of children as something that must be understood. Motherhood is more difficult than you can imagine, they argue, so you must not judge women who are driven over the brink. Yates became Now's poster child for postpartum depression. Now insisted that Yates murdered children not of her own volition, but because of the effects of postpartum psychosis. This is a new version of the Twinkie defense, a term coined in 1979 when a lawyer successfully defended a man accused of a double homicide by saying his client's diet of junk food, primarily Twinkies, was what had caused him to commit the murder. And uh, that the Twinkie defense is determinism. That's the basis for it, determinism. It is the error in thinking that suggests that nobody has free will and that everybody is forced to do whatever they're doing by by powers beyond their control. In this particular case, the sugar of the Twinkies, and he eats the Twinkies because of the advertising. The advertising forces him to buy them and eat them, and the sugar and other, uh, ostensibly, other ingredients are what then affected his mind and caused him to commit a double homicide. The other thing I wanted to note about this particular section that really stands out is um, about the feminine elite that they could persuade the American public to accept the murder of children is something that must be understood. Now, you're going to hear that from the lefties in your life. Uh, You can hear it a lot. Wherever you go, from a lefty, um, if you come out and you talk about Andrea Yates or anything else, let's say there's a, a murder whatever the situation is, some kind of crime that's been committed, 
and you condemn and you condemn the the criminal you know you say uh, this person should be put in jail for the rest of their life they should be uh, executed whatever the case may be they're they're a horrible person they're evil and they should be in in prison for the rest of their life let's use that you're going to hear from the left they're going to say oh but you don't understand and that can be a very, very intimidating statement. Okay? Because everybody wants to be understanding. Everybody wants to think of themselves as being somebody with an open mind. Okay? And under normal circumstances, if we're all acting in good faith, yes, that would be the case. But when you're dealing with somebody on the left, they're using words as weapons. They're using our customs and courtesies as weapons. They're using politeness as a weapon or a shield, I should um, you know, point out. But the point is that the way to deal with this when anyone tells you you need to understand something that is clearly un- not understandable, clearly heinous. A woman drowns her children in a bathtub, five kids in a bathtub, and uh, somebody tells you, well, you've got to understand. You need to stop them immediately. And tell them, no, you have to understand. You have to understand that drowning five children is wrong. It is heinous. It is hideous. It is evil. And you stand your ground. Do not let the person on the left intimidate you into having some kind of a discussion about whether or not what is obviously evil is evil. Don't have the discussion, because it, once you have the discussion, you lose the argument, period. There are some arguments in which you will lose just by entertaining the argument. One of them is the issue of God's existence. If a lefty says to you, let's debate the existence of God, and you're a God-fearing Christian, you must say, no, thank you. I don't care what they say after that, what, are you afraid, or you be 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 No, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. Why? Because if you say, okay, let's have the debate, you've already conceded the possibility that God does not exist. And that's all the left wants from you. That's all they need. Just by having the argument, you've conceded the point. Don't do it. Same thing in a case with Andrea Yates. We don't need, it doesn't require a long conceptual chain, to quote Ayn Rand, to figure out that what she did was evil. Drowning her five kids was evil. Now, does she should she be in a prison? Should she be in an insane asylum? That's an issue of justice, and that's an issue for the courts to decide. You know, do their analyses or whatever, talk, have her talk to doctors and whatnot, and they can figure out where's the best place to put her. Should she be separated from society? Absolutely. Now, the other thing is that you may think, well, you know, uh, look at all the power that the NOW organization is exerting here. How can I, how can I face that kind of power? It's very simple. If, let's say, the NOW organization, well, the NOW organization, for instance, helped to get Monica Berger off. Okay, the judge exonerated her from uh, murder, murdering her child. But guess what? Guess who gets to decide whether or not I associate with Monica Berger? That's right, I do. So I get to decide, you know what, judge? I don't give a rat's ass what you decided. I'm not going to talk to her. I'm not going to have anything to do with her. If I see this woman coming down the street, I'm crossing the street to get away from her. If I have to, I will run. And every single individual in this country has the same power. You can decide, okay, the courts want to get screwball on me. They want to entertain insanity. That's up to them. I don't have to, and I'm not going to. So when we come back, it's going to be, I'm going to read from the... uh, David Horowitz's book, The Black Book of the American Left. And thank you very much. 
Uh, I like to do David Horowitz and Tammy Bruce kind of side by side because uh, both of them, again, are examples of people that really know and understand the left because they've lived it. They've uh, they've been lefties. Uh, they become conservatives, uh, and uh, so and they really know and understand the way the left thinks and the way the left operates. It knows in ways uh, that uh, Rush Limbaugh will never know, uh, nor Sean Sean Hannity for that matter. After Betty was murdered, I realized I should have read the signs and known the dangers. I bore my responsibility for what had happened. Those recognitions are what the conservative part of my life has been about. I wrote an extensive memoir of those events in which I took full responsibility, in particular for not knowing what I should have known. If Kathy Boudin had done the same, if she had attempted to re-examine the premises that led her to commit her crimes and had made a full accounting afterward, I would still have held her accountable, but would not have judged her as harshly as I have. A crucial fact about me that the play ignores is that I did not need to become a conservative to be critical of Kathy Boudin. And the play he's talking about is that uh, the left made a play that was basically included a character that was supposed to represent David Horowitz. And the Weather Underground. Let's go back to that one. A crucial fact about me that the play ignores is that I did not need to become a conservative to be critical of Kathy Boudin and the Weather Underground. Nor was I alone in this. In 1971, when one still a radical, I wrote a widely read article in Ramparts attacking the Weather Underground for its terrorist ideas and practices. My article focused on the explosion of the bomb that Boudin's Weather Underground cell was planning to detonate in a terrorist act. Three members of the cell were killed in that explosion, which destroyed the Greenwich Village townhouse they had turned into their bomb factory. Boudin was in the townhouse at the time and survived. She then continued her chosen path of radical violence. The townhouse episode includes crucial facts that the playwright suppresses in order to load his case for Boudin's redemption. In the place... In the play, the Boudin character, who is named Allison, claims that her terrorist acts were aimed at property, not people. She is thus presented as someone innocent of the purposes for which the bomb was to be used. In the play, it is my character who persuades her to buy the nails that turn the bomb into an anti-personnel weapon. The black policeman, who becomes the inadvertent victim of the bomb, is killed by one of those nails. In the play, Allison's innocence of the bomb's malicious purpose is central to the plot and to the playwright's twofold plan, to create sympathy and forgiveness for Allison, Kathy, and to indict my character, the neoconservative, as the villain instead. <clears throat> in fact, however, Kathy Boudin and her comrades were deliberately building an anti-personnel bomb filled with nails, intending to detonate it at a social dance at Fort Dix. The dance would be attended by 18-year-old draftees and their dates. The real Kathy Boudin was a calculating terrorist with no mercy for those she regarded as her political enemies, even if they were innocent draftees. My opposition to her parole then and now is because she committed heinous acts and has refused to face up to them, not because she opposed the Vietnam War. The only article I ever wrote about her parole, which seems to have incensed the playwright, opens with this sentence, quote, the separate reality of radicals, which made them unable to comprehend their own deeds, was made vivid for me in a New York Times story I read later about the parole appeal of Kathy Boudin, unquote. The author of Something You Did never sought to interview me to find out what my real views were before defaming me in his play. He's a perfect example of radicals who inhabit a who inhabit a separate reality, who are unable to understand how others see them and therefore unable to to understand themselves. In Something You Did, I am represented as a self-serving cynic and a representative specimen of the system I once opposed. My character, Gene, cuts million-dollar deals on the basis of his fame as a radical turncoat and receives $50,000 speaking fees to spread his noxious views. I wish. Perhaps the playwright was thinking of Cornell West or Michael Moore. If they do command such fees, it's because they have had no second thoughts, and because their talk resonates with the prevailing views of the culturally dominant left. In addition to being materialistic and a narcissist, the character allegedly based on me is portrayed as an embittered racist and a xenophobic Jew. In constructing my character as that of a wealthy cynic, the playwright chooses to confront a radical cliché rather than the person who, in his eyes, was Boudin's most corrosive critic. 
as far as my attitudes toward money and non-Jews and blacks, I am pretty much the same individual I was when I was on the left, though hopefully wiser. I'm still a missionary driven by certain ideals, rather than the avarice operator represented in the play. My conservative views are inspired by what I see as the destructive ambitions and practices of the left, and their negative impact on the very people, blacks, the poor, the Vietnamese, whom radicals have claimed to support. Any honest reader of my work would know that. A confrontation between a radical and a former radical who has had second thoughts about the practical results of his commitments would have provided a more interesting subject for this play than the progressive melodrama the playwright has settled on. But melodrama it is, and therefore the conservative must be exposed not only as an opponent of radical terrorists, but as a racist, and since he is Jewish, a tribalist. In short, a reactionary. In the play, my character refers to the murder of two civil rights workers in Mississippi while deliberately omitting the third, James Cheney, because he was black. For this reactionary, only Jews count. Uh, those who have followed my career in writings will know, on the other hand, that I'm more faithful to the civil rights ideals of the 60s in which leftists claim to believe than the author of this play. In my autobiography, Radical Son, the point I made about these issues, uh, which the playwright grossly misrepresents, is that Jewish radicals like Kathy Boudin feel superior to the groups they are claiming to help, in this instance blacks, and so fail to understand them as individuals. The terrorist act that provides the basis for this play was committed by a group of violent black criminals whom uh, Boudin mistook for black victims and comrades. The climax of the play is Allison's parole board appeal. She defends herself by claiming that whatever she did and whatever mistakes she made were in behalf of the Vietnamese and Cambodians, that the real criminals are the Americans who supported the anti-communist cause. In other words, there is nothing she needs to regret about her political views that led her to commit her heinous acts. And anyway, the acts her adversaries committed were worse. There are two problems with this attempted exculpation. The first is that Kathy Boudin and the anti-war left really didn't care that much about the Vietnamese and the Cambodians. When America left Indochina in 1975 and the Cambodians and Vietnamese were being slaughtered by the communists in one of the largest genocides of the 20th century, there were no protests by the American left of these atrocities, not by Kathy Boudin and not by her comrades in arms. The second problem with Allison's appeal is the fact, factual premise on which it is based is a lie. Kathy Boudin was responsible for the death of a black policeman, Waverly Brown, actually the first black policeman ever hired by the Nyack police force. But the act that killed him was not and could not have been a protest against the Vietnam War. Officer Brown was killed by Kathy Boudin and her friends in 1981, eight years after American troops were withdrawn and six after the last American officials had left Vietnam and at a time when the communists were firmly in power. This play is dishonest to its core. It misrepresents the reasons Kathy Boudin committed her crime. It misrepresents the crime itself. It whitewashes her culpability as a supporter of terrorist acts. Finally, on a personal note, it misrepresents who I am and why I opposed her parole. So, quick uh, thing on this. Uh, the I, He would have been better to stick to, in analyzing this play, and, and approach it from the standpoint of, the left makes a play that is uh, supposed to be uh, that's supposed to agitate and make people upset, or maybe even allegedly make people think. But they use a bunch of tricks, psychologistic tricks, and these are the tricks that they're using, and and do it as like an expose, rather than as a looking at it as though this is an attack on him personally, and that he needs to. A respond because basically on the one hand he's saying that the the play really has no merit i.e it's arbitrary and on the other hand he defends himself well you can't have it both ways if it's an arbitrary claim it needs to be ignored and if you feel the need to defend yourself then perhaps it's not arbitrary after all maybe they're making some uh, uh, apparently valid points that need to be addressed and so uh, again, I would think that I would have a tendency to think the former rather than the latter, that more than likely this play, I've never seen it, is arbitrary and makes arbitrary claims. Uh, and so therefore, he sh the only way to deal with it, uh, two ways, either ignore it flat out or 
expose all the little tricks that they're using, the psychologistic little tricks that they're using to uh, try to appeal to people. And um, that brings us to the conclusion of another episode of The Drill. And until next time, I thank you very much for listening and have a great day.